Okay, welcome to CE340 Fluid Mechanics. My name is Dr. Riefler. In this first lecture, we're going to go through some introductory material and talk about density of fluids. I want to get something out of the way right off the bat. Um, on my calculator, it says one kilogram equals 2.2 pounds. As you all know now from physics, that's, that's an incorrect statement, right? Um, kilogram is a unit of mass, whereas pounds is a unit of force. So um, we need to be careful about how we use those two different units. In reality, um, we can say one kilogram is equal to 2.20 pounds mass, and that's a little better. That pound mass is an appropriate unit for mass, but it's not a very good unit. It's actually quite confusing, I find. I think the more appropriate unit to use is a slug. Um, so for the course, I would encourage you to use slugs as a unit of mass in the English unit system. Um, you can use these conversions to go from kilograms to slugs or from slugs to pound mass. If you're ever given something in pound mass, my advice would be to just convert it right to slugs and work from there. The reason why is um, this relationship is, is described in um, Newton's second law, force equals mass times gravity, or the force of weight. Um, is equals mass times gravity. Um, kilograms and slugs both work with that gravity constant, but if you use pounds of mass, you have to change that formula for that to work. So I would avoid that if I could. All right, fluids. Um, fluid is defined in the textbook as a substance that deforms continuously when acted on by a shearing stress of any magnitude. Now the key word here is continuously. Because as you know, you can get a solid to deform when you apply a stress to it, but the difference is that the solid pushes back, and at some point it reaches a point of equilibrium or it fractures. Um, a fluid doesn't do that. A fluid deforms, and it continues to, de to deform as you apply a force to it. There, it doesn't push back like a solid does. Um, we typically think about fluids as liquids, but in this class, um, the fluid encompasses both liquids and gases because gases behave, behave the same way. They deform continuously, just like liquids do. We do still have to distinguish the two. Gases and liquids are different from one another. As you know, gases in gases, the molecules are widely spaced, and there's a lot of free space there so that the volume of the gas can change depending on temperature and pressure. Liquids, on the other hand, the molecules are very tightly packed together, and you really get very little change in volume with changes in temperature and pressure. We, we call those properties incompressible and compressible, and we'll, we'll return over and over again to those, to those words. There are some other substances that kind of fall in this gray area between liquids and solids, things like toothpaste and mayonnaise. And we call these Bingham, Bingham, so, Bingham plastics. And um, the way to define Bingham plastics is that they actually they appear like solids, so they will hold their shape under the force of gravity. But if you push on them hard enough, if you if you exceed a minimum stress, then they begin to flow like fluids. They begin to deform continuously. The first property of fluids that we, we're going to talk about is density. <clears throat> and we'll use the Greek letter rho to describe density throughout this class. And as you've learned from physics, it's mass per unit volume of a fluid. Um, for liquids, density is fairly constant. We consider them incompressible, although it does vary slightly with temperature. For gases, density varies widely depending on temperature and pressure. And we actually have to use another tool. We have to use the ideal gas law to determine density of gases. And we'll discuss that in a later lecture. There are a number of different um, parameters we can use to describe this concept of density. One is specific volume, which is mathematically just the inverse of density. We won't use specific volume too much. Specific weight yeah, we'll use quite a bit, and this is defined by the Greek letter gamma, and it's density times the gravity constant. And then also specific gravity we'll use quite a bit. Um, it's, it's described as the capital letter S, and it's the density of the fluid that you're working with divided by the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius. 
specific gravity is particularly useful because it compares um, fluid that you're working with or the object you're working with to water. If you have a specific gravity of one, then the, the object is um, similar to water. If it's less than one, you'd expect the object to float. If it's greater than one, you'd expect the object to sink. Um, keep in mind also that these different concepts, density, specific weight, specific gravity, they're all dependent on one another. If you, if you know one of them, if you know the density, you can then calculate specific weight and specific gravity, and vice versa. If you're given specific gravity, you can calculate the density and the specific weight from that information. And here are some tables in the back of your textbook. These are in um, the appendices. And on the left is a table of the density of water at different temperatures. And as you can see, it does vary, but not very much. For most problems we'll use in this class, we'll just use a constant density value for water. Usually the 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed is what's used. Um, on the right, you can see a table of the density of air. And this is at atmospheric pressure. And in this case, you can see the density varies quite a bit depending on temperature. Um, in reality, again, you would never look up the density of air. You would calculate it using the ideal gas law, which we'll discuss in another lecture.